to introduce you today to Eva and Chris. Um, Eva, she is a senior researcher at Privacy International. She works on uh, gender, economical, and social rights, and how they interplay with uh, the right to privacy, especially in marginalized communities. Um, Chris, she is the privacy lead at uh, technology lead at Privacy International, and um, his day-to-day -day job is uh, to expose company and how they profit from individuals. Um, and uh, especially specifically today, they will tell us how these companies can even profit from uh, your menstruations. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's, uh, it's nice to be back at CCC. I was at CCC last year. Um, this talk is going to be, this is, if, you were at the, if you were at my talk from last year, this is going to be like the, a slight vague part two. And if you're not, I'm just going to give you a very brief recap because there is like a relationship between the two. Um, so yeah, this, as I say, this, I'll give a little bit of background about how this project started. Then we're going to talk a little bit about menstruation apps and what a menstruation app actually is. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit through some of the data that these, these apps are collecting. We're going to talk through our, how we did our research, our research methodology, and then what our findings are and our conclusions. So last year, I, I and a colleague did a, a project around how Facebook collects uh, data about users on Android devices using um, the, Andro uh, the Android Facebook SDK. Um, and this is whether you have a Facebook account or not. And for that project, uh, we really looked when you first opened apps and uh, didn't really have to do very much interaction with them, particularly about the automatic sending of data in a post-GDPR context. And, this, and so we, we looked at a load of apps for that project, um, including a couple of period trackers. Uh, and that kind of led onto this project, because we, were, we as I say, looked at loads of apps uh, across the disparate uh, different areas of um, categories. Whereas, so we thought we'd like hone in a little bit on period trackers to uh, see you know, what, what kind of data, because they're far more sensitive than many of the other apps on there, like, well, you might consider your music history to be very sensitive, but... <laughs> so... Yeah, so, uh, just, just, to, just as a quick update on the previous work from uh, last year, we actually followed up with uh, all of the companies uh, from that from that report, and uh, by the end of like going through lo multiple rounds of right of response, over 60% of them had changed practices either by disabling the Facebook SDK in their app, or uh, disabling it till you ha you gave consent, or removing it entirely. So I'm going to pass over to Eva Blondemonte, who's going to talk through uh, a little bit about menstruation apps. <laughs> Um, so I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Although if you didn't know what a menstruation app is and you still bothered coming to this talk, I'm extremely grateful. Um, so how many of you are, uh, are using a menstruation apps or have a partner who's been using a menstruation apps? Oh my God. Oh my, okay, I didn't expect that. I thought it was going to be much less. Um, okay, well, I, for the few of you who might not know what a menstruation app, I'm still going to... Uh, go quickly through what a menstruation app is. It's uh, the idea of a menstruation app. We also call them period tracker. It's to have an app that tracks your menstruation cycle uh, so that you, they tell you what days you're most fertile. And, uh, and you can obviously, if you're using them to try and get pregnant, or uh, if you have, for example, a painful period, uh, you can sort of plan uh, accordingly. Uh, so that's essentially the main two reason uh, uh, users would be uh, would be looking into uh, using menstruation apps, pregnancy, uh, period tracking. Now, how did this research start? As uh, as Chris said, obviously there was uh, this whole research that had been done by Privacy International uh, last year on uh, on various apps and. As Chris also already said, what I was particularly interested in uh, was, uh, was the kind of, uh, of data that menstruation apps are collecting. Because as we'll explain in this talk, it's, uh, it's really actually not just uh, limited to, um, to a menstruation cycle. 
And so I was interested in seeing what actually happens to the data uh, when it is being shared. Uh, so I should say we're really uh, standing in the shoulders of giants uh, when it comes to this research. Uh, there was previously existing research on, uh, on information apps that was done by a partner organization, Coding Rights, in Brazil. Uh, so they had done research on the kind of uh, data that was collected by menstruation apps uh, and the granularity of this data. And uh, the other very interesting thing they were looking at was uh, the gender normativity of those apps. And um, Chris and I have been looking at, you know, dozens uh, of those apps. And, you know, they have various data sharing practices as well explained in the stock. But they have one, one thing that all of them have in common is that they're all pink. Um, the other thing is that they, um, they talk to their users as women. They, you know, don't sort of even compute the fact that maybe not all their users are women. Um, so there is, yeah, a, a very sort of like narrow, uh, narrow perspective of like uh, pregnancy and females' bodies and, uh, and how does uh, female sexuality function. Um, now, as I was saying, uh, when you're using a menstruation app, uh, it's not just your menstruation cycle that you're entering. Um, so this is, um, this is some of the questions uh, that menstruation apps ask. Uh, so sex, there's a lot about sex that they want to know. Um, how often is it protected or unprotected? Um, are you smoking? Are you drinking? Are you partying? How often? Uh, we even had one, ask, one app that was asking about masturbation, um, your sleeping pattern, uh, your coffee drinking habits. Um, it, it, one thing that's really interesting is that, and we'll talk a little bit more again about this later, but uh, there is uh, there's very strong uh, data protection laws in Europe called GDPR, as most of you will know. And um, it says that only data that's strictly necessary should be collected. So I'm still unclear what masturbation has to do with uh, tracking your menstruation cycle, but... Um, other, uh, other thing that was collected uh, is about your health. And uh, the reason health is, uh, is so important is, uh, is also related to data protection laws because when you're collecting health data, uh, you need to show that you're taking extra step to collect this data because it's considered uh, sensitive uh, personal data. Uh, so extra step in terms of uh, getting explicit consent from the users, uh, but also it's recept on, to, uh, on behalf of the data controller in terms of, um, of showing that they're making extra step for the security of this data. Uh, so this is the type of uh, question that was asked. There's so much asked about vaginal discharge uh, and the kind of vaginal discharge you get with all sorts of weird adjectives for this, tiki, creamy. Um, so yeah, they clearly thought a lot about this. Um, and there's a lot about mood as well. Um, even, yeah, I didn't know romantic was uh, a, a mood, but apparently it is. Um, and, and what's interesting, obviously, about mood, uh, in the context where, you know, we've seen stories like uh, Cambridge Analytica, for example. So we know, uh, we know how much companies, we know how much co political parties are trying to understand how we think, how we feel. Uh, so that's actually quite significant to have, uh, to have an app that's uh, collecting information about how we feel on a daily basis. And, and obviously, like, when people enter all this data, their expectation at that point is that the data stays between, uh, between them and the app. Um, and actually, there is very little in the privacy policy that, could, uh, that would normally suggest otherwise. So this is the moment where I actually should say we're not making this up. Like literally everything in this list of questions were things, literal terms that they were asking. Um, so we set out to look at the most popular menstruation apps. Do you want to? Yeah. Carry on. I forgot to introduce myself as well. Really, that's a terrible speaking habit. I'm Christopher, Christopher Weatherhead. Yep. Privacy International's uh, technology lead. So yeah, we, as, as I said about our previous research, we have actually looked at most of the very popular menstruation apps, the ones that have uh, hundreds of thousands of downloads, 
And these apps, are, like as, as we were saying, this kind of work has been done before, and a lot of these apps have come into quite a lot of criticism. I won't, I'll spare you the free advertising about which ones particularly, but most of them don't do anything particularly outrageous, at least between the app and the developer's servers. They, a lot of them don't share with third parties at that stage, so you can't look between the app and the server to see whether they're sharing. They might be sharing data from the developer's server to Facebook or to other places, but at least you can't see in between. But we're, a, we're an international organization, and we work around the globe. And most of the, most of the apps that get the most downloads are particularly Western, US, European, but they're not the most popular apps necessarily in a lot of uh, contexts like India and the Philippines and Latin America. So we thought we'd have a look and see those apps. They're all available in Europe, but they're not, you know, they're not necessarily the most popular in Europe. And this is where things start getting interesting. So what exactly did we do? Well, we started off by triaging through a large number of period trackers. And as Eva said earlier, every logo must be pink. Um, and we were just kind of looking through to see how many trackers. This is using Exodus privacy. We have our own instance in PI. And uh, we just looked through to see how many trackers and who the trackers were. So for example, this is Maya, which is exceptionally popular in India, predominantly. It's made by an Indian company. And as you can see, it's got a large number of uh, bundled trackers in it. Clevertap, Facebook, Flurry, Google, and in mobile, don't worry. We? Um, so we went through this process, and this allowed us to cut down, because uh, there's, <laughs> there's hundreds of period trackers. Not all of them are necessarily bad, but it's nice to just try and see which ones had the most trackers, where they were used, and try and just triage them a little bit. From this, we then ran through uh, PI's uh, inter interception environment, which is a, a VM that I made. Uh, I actually made it last year for the talk I gave last year, but um, and I said I'd release it after the talk, and it took me like three months to release it. But it's now available. You can go onto PI's website and download it. It's a man-in-the-middle proxy uh, with a few settings, uh, for mainly for looking at uh, iOS and Android apps to do data interception between them. And so we run through that, and uh, we, get to have, we get to have a look at all the data that's being sent to and from both the app developer and third parties. And here's what we found. So out of the six apps we look at, uh, five shared data with Facebook. And w out of those five, uh, three ping Facebook to let them know when their users when, uh, were downloading the app and, uh, and opening the app. And um, that's already quite significant information, and we'll get to that later. Now, what's actually interesting, uh, and the focus of our report was on the two apps uh, that showed every single piece of information uh, that the users entered with Facebook and other third parties. So just to brief you, the, the two apps we, uh, we focused on are both called Maya, uh, so that's not very uh, helpful. One is spelled Maya, M-A-Y-A. -A, the other one is spelled Maya, M-I-A. Uh, so yeah, just bear with me, because this is uh, actually quite confusing. But so initially, we'll focus on Maya, M-Y-A. Uh, which is, uh, as uh, Chris mentioned, it's an app that's based uh, in India. Uh, they have a user base of uh, several millions. Um, they are based, yeah, based in India. User base mostly in India, also in the quite popular in the Philippines. Um, so what's interesting with Maya is that they start sharing data with Facebook before you even get to agree to their privacy policy. So I should say already about the privacy policy of a lot of those apps that we looked at is that they're literally the definition of small prints. Uh, it's, uh, it's very hard to read. It's, uh, it's uh, legalese language. It, it really puts into perspective the whole uh, question of consent in GDPR because GDPR says that like, consent uh, must be informed. So uh, you must be able to understand what you're consenting to. Uh, when you're reading these extremely long, uh, extremely opaque privacy policies of law, literally all the menstruation apps we've looked at, uh, excluding one that didn't even bother putting their privacy policy actually, uh, it's, uh, it's opaque, uh, it's very hard to understand, 
Uh, and they absolutely definitely do not say that they're sharing information with Facebook. Uh, so the, as I said, data sharing happens before you get to agree to their privacy policy. The other thing that's also worth remembering is that when they share information with Facebook, it doesn't matter if you have a Facebook account or not, the information is still being relayed. Uh, the other interesting thing that you'll notice as well in several of the slides is that uh, the information that's being shared uh, is tied to your identity through your uh, unique ID identifiers, uh, also your email address. Uh, but basically, most of the questions we got when we released the, the research was like, oh, if I use a fake email address or if I use a fake name, is that okay? Uh, well, it, it's not, because even if you have a Facebook account, through your uh, unique ID, ID identifier, uh, they, would, uh, they would definitely be able to, to trace you back. So there's, um, yeah, there, there is a little way to actually, um, uh, to actually anonymize this process, unless, well, at the end, unless you're deliberately trying to trick it and use a separate phone, uh, basically for regular users, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, so this is what it looks like when you, uh, when you enter the, the data. Uh, so as I said, didn't lie to you, this is uh, the kind of questions they're asking you. And uh, this is what it looks like when it's being, uh, when it's being shared with Facebook. Um, so you see the symptom changing, for example, like uh, blood pressure, uh, swelling, acne. This is all being shared through graph.facebook, uh, through the Facebook SDK. Uh, this is what it looks like when they showed your contraceptive practice. So again, like uh, we're talking, uh, we're talking health data here. We're talking se uh, sensitive data. We're talking about data that should normally require uh, extra steps in terms of collecting it, in terms of how it's being processed. Uh, but nope, in this case, it was shared exactly like the rest. Uh, this is what it looks like. Well, so yeah, with uh, your sex life, it was a little bit different. So this is why it looks like when they're asking you about, you know, you just had sex, was it protected, was it unprotected? Uh, the way it was shared uh, with Facebook uh, was a little bit more cryptic, so to speak. So if you have uh, protected sex, it was entered as love to uh, unprotected sex. It was uh, uh, entered as love three. Um, I managed to figure that out pretty quickly, so it's not so cryptic. Um, so it, yeah, that's also quite funny. So um, Maya had a, a diary section where they encouraged people to enter like their notes uh, and uh, and their personal thoughts. And I mean, it, it's a menstruation app, so you can sort of get the idea of uh, of what uh, people are going to be writing down in there or expected to write on. It's not going to be their shopping list, uh, although shopping lists could also be. Uh, personal, sensitive personal information, but um, so we were like, wondering what would happen if we were to write in this uh, in this diary and how this data would be processed. Uh, so we entered, literally we entered something very sensitive, entered here. Uh, this is what we wrote and literally everything we wrote was uh, shared with Facebook. Um, Maya also shared your health data, uh, not just with Facebook, but with a company called uh, CleverTap that's based in California. Uh, so what's CleverTap? CleverTap is, uh, is a data broker, basically. It's, uh, it's a company that is sort of similar to Facebook with the Facebook SDK. Uh, they expect app developers to hand over the data, and in exchange, app developers get uh, insights about like, how people use the app, what, what time of the day, um, you know, the age of their users. They, they get all sorts of information and analytics out of, those, uh, out of the, the data that they, they share with, uh, with this company. Um, it took us some time yet to figure it out because uh, it's shared as uh, Wicked, Wicked Wizard, was that? Uh, Wicked Rocket. Wicked Rocket, yeah. Um, yeah, but at uh, exactly the same. Uh, everything that was shared with Facebook was also shared uh, with CleverTab. Again, with the um, email, uh, email address that we were using, uh, everything was shared. Now, let's look at the other Maya. Uh, it's not just the name that's similar. It's also the data sharing practices. Uh, Maya is based in, um, in Cyprus, so in European Union. I should say, in all cases, 
uh, regardless of where the company is based, the moment that they uh, market the product in the European Union, uh, so i.e. like literally every app we looked at, uh, they need to, um, they need to, well, they should respect uh, GDPR, uh, data, European Data Protection Law. Um, now, the first thing that, uh, that Maya asked when you are uh, starting the app, and again, I'll get to that later, but the significance of this uh, is why you're using the app. Are you using it to try and get pregnant, or are you just using it to try uh, to track your periods? Now, it's interesting because it doesn't change at all the way you interact with the app eventually. The app stays exactly the same, uh, but this is actually the most important kind of data. This is literally uh, the gold, uh, the gem of, uh, of data collection. It's trying to know when a woman is trying to get pregnant or not. Uh, so the reason this is the first question they ask is, well, my guess on this is that they want to make sure that like, even if you don't actually use the app, that's at least that much information uh, they can collect about you. Um, and so this information was shared immediately with Facebook uh, and with AppsFlyer. AppsFlyer is very similar to uh, CleverTap in the way it works. It's also a company that collects data from those apps and um, and out of uh, services in terms of analytics and uh, insights into uh, user behavior. Uh, it's based in Israel. So this is, uh, this is what it looks like uh, when, you, uh, when you enter the information. Uh, so yeah, masturbation, pill, uh, what kind of pill you're taking, uh, your lifestyle habits. Uh, now, where it's slightly different is that the information doesn't immediately get shared uh, with Facebook, but based on the information you enter, uh, you get uh, articles that are tailored for you. Uh, so for example, like when you select masturbation, you will get, you know, masturbation, what you want to know, but are ashamed to ask. Um, now, what's eventually shared with Facebook is actually the kind of article that's being, uh, that's being offered to you. So basically, yeah, the, the information is shared indirectly because then, you know, your Facebook can sort of um, uh, deduce that uh, you've just entered ma masturbation because you're getting an article about masturbation. Uh, so this is what happened when you enter alcohol. So uh, expected effects of alcohol on a woman's body. This is what happened when you enter a protected sex. So effectively, all the information is still shared just indirectly through the articles you're getting. Uh, and um, yeah, la last thing also I should say on this in terms of the articles that you're getting is that uh, sometimes they were sort of uh, also kind of like crossing the data. With, like, so the articles will be about like, oh, you have cramps outside of your, um, outside of your periods, for example, like during your, the, your fertile phase. Uh, and so you'll get the article specifically for this. So the information that's shared uh, with Facebook and with Apps Flyer is that this person is in their fertile period in this phase of their cycles and having cramps. Now, why are menstruation apps obsessed with finding out if you're trying to get pregnant? And so this goes back to uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the things I mentioned before about you know, about wanting to know uh, in the very first place if you're trying to get pregnant or not. And uh, also, the, this is probably why a lot of those um, apps are trying to, to really nail down um, in their language, in their discourse, uh, how you're using the apps for. Um, when a person is pregnant, their, uh, their purchasing habit, their consumer habits change. When well, obviously, you know, you, you buy not only for yourself, but you start buying for, uh, for others as well. Uh, but also you're buying, uh, you're buying new things you've never purchased before. So what a regular person will be quite difficult to change, to change a purchasing habit. Uh, with a person that's pregnant, um, they'll be, advertisers will be really keen to target them because this is a point of their life uh, where, their, where their habits change and where they can be more easily influenced one way or another. So in other words, it's sort of peak advertising time. Uh, in other more words in picture, there's a research done in uh, 2014 in the US that was trying to sort of evaluate uh, the, um, uh, the value of, uh, of data for a person. So an average American person that's not pregnant 
uh, was 10 cents. Uh, a person who's pregnant uh, would be $1.50. So you may have noticed uh, we're using the past tense when we talked about, well, I hope I did when I was speaking, definitely in the slides at least. Uh, we use the past tense when we talk about uh, data sharing of, uh, of the apps. Uh, that's because both Maya and Mia, which were the, the two apps who were really targeting this different report, uh, stopped using the Facebook way, uh, SDK when we wrote to them about our research before we published it. Um, <laughs> so it was, uh, it was quite nice because they didn't even like, rely on actually us publishing the report. It was merely at the stage of like, hey, this is all right of response. We're going to be publishing this. Uh, do you have anything to say about this? And essentially what they had to say is like, yep, sorry, apologies, we are uh, we're stopping this. Um, I think, you know, what's really interesting as well for me about like the, 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 um, how quick the response was is uh, it really shows how this is, this is not a vital service for them. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a plus. This is something uh, that's a useful tool, uh, but the fact that they immediately, uh, that they could immediately just stop using it, I think really shows that, um, you know, it was, I, I wouldn't say a lazy practice, but it's a, it's a case of like, as long as no one's complaining, then they're, they're going to start using, they're going to carry on using it. Um, and I think that was also the, the discourse with your, uh, with, with your research. There was also a lot that changed their behaviors after. And a lot of the developers sometimes don't even realize necessarily what data their app is sharing with people like Facebook, with people like CleverTap or whoever. Uh, they just in integrate the SDK and hope for the best. Uh, we also got this interesting uh, response from, uh, from Outsider is that it's very hypocritical. Essentially, what they were saying is like, oh, like we specifically ask our customers or, uh, or yeah, to not share uh, health data with us, specifically for the reason I mentioned earlier, which is wh because of GDPR, you're normally expected to, um, uh, to take extra step when you process uh, sensitive health data. Uh, so their response is that they ask their customer to not share uh, health data or sensitive personal data, so they don't, you know, they don't become liable uh, in terms of the law. So they were like, "Oh, we're sorry, like this is a breach of our contract." Uh, now the reason is very hypocritical is that obviously when they have contracts with menstruation apps, and actually Maya was not the only apps they were menstruation apps they were working with. I mean, you know, what do you can you genuinely expect in terms of the kind of data you're going to receive? So here's the conclusion for us, that research is, uh, works. It's fun. It's easy to do. Um, you know, Chris has not published uh, the, uh, the environment. Um, it doesn't actually, once the environment is sort of uh, set up, uh, it doesn't actually require a technical background. As you saw from the, uh, the slides, it's, it's pretty straightforward to actually understand how the data is being shared. Uh, so you should do it too. Uh, but more broadly, uh, we think it's really important to do more research, uh, not just at this stage of, of the, the process, um, but generally about the, the security and the data, the data sharing practices of apps, because you know, it's, um, it's hard a lot, and more and more people are using, uh, are interacting with technology and using the internet. Uh, so we need to, to think much more carefully about the, the security implication of the apps we use. And obviously, uh, it works. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, please line up in front of the microphones. We can start with microphone two. Um, hi, thank you. So you mentioned that uh, now we can check whether uh, data is being shared with third parties on the path between the user and the developer, but we cannot know for the other apps and for these whether it's not being shared later from the, develop from the company to other companies. Have you thought of, have you conceptualized some ways of testing that? Have you, is it possible to? Yeah, so you could, like, you could do a uh, data subject access request under the data, uh, GDPR. Um, and that, like, the problem is it's quite hard to necessarily know 
how the process is, the system outside of the app to server relationship, it's quite hard to know what the process is of that data, and so it's quite opaque. They might apply a different identifier to it, they might do other, other manipulation to that data, so trying to track down and prove that this bit of data belonged to you is quite challenging. This is something we're going to try, uh, we're going to be doing in 2020, actually. Uh, we're going to be doing data subject access requests of those apps that we've been looking at to see uh, to see if we find anything, both under GDPR, but also under uh, different uh, data protection laws in different countries, uh, to see basically, uh, basically what we get, how much we can obtain from that. Um, so I'd go with the signal, Angel. So what advice can you give us on how we can make people understand that from a privacy perspective, it's not better to use pen and paper instead of entering sensitive data into any of these apps? I, I, I definitely wouldn't uh, advise that. I wouldn't advise pen and paper. I think for us, like really the, the key, uh, the, the work we're doing uh, is not actually targeting users, it's targeting companies. We think it's companies that really need to do better. Uh, we'll often ask about uh, you know, advice to customers or advice to users and consumers. Uh, but what I think and what I, we've been telling companies as well is that you know, their users trust you and they have the right to trust you. They also have the right to expect that you're respecting the law. Uh, the European Union has a very ambitious uh, legislation when it comes to privacy uh, with GDPR. Uh, and so the least they can expect is that you're respecting the law. Um, and, uh, and so, no, I, I would, uh, this is the thing, is that I think people have the right to, to use those apps. They have the right to say, well, this is a useful service for me. Uh, it's really companies that need, to, uh, that need to up their game, that need to live up to the expectations of their, uh, of their consumers, not the other way around. My microphone one. Hi. So, from the talk... It seems, and I think that's what you did, you mostly focused on Android-based apps. Mm -hmm. uh, can you maybe comment on what the situation is with iOS? Is there any technical difficulty, or is it anything completely different with respect to these apps and apps in general? Um, there's not really a technical difficulty. Like The setup's a little bit different, but functionally, you can look at the same kind of data. The focus here, though, is also... So it's twofold in some respects. Um, most of the places that these apps are used are heavily dominated Android territories, places like India, the Philippines. Uh, uh, iOS penetration there and uh, uh, Apple device penetration is very low. There's no technical reason not to look at Andro uh, Apple devices, but uh, like in this particular context, it's not necessarily hugely relevant. Does that answer your question? And technically, with your setup, you could also do the same analysis with an iOS device. Yeah, there's, I'd say there's a little bit of a, a change to how you, you have to register the device as an MDM device, like have a profile, a mobile profile, but otherwise you can do exactly the same level of interception. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is actually related to the last question. It's a little bit technical. Sure. I'm also doing some research on apps, and I've noticed with the newest versions of Android that they're making it more difficult to install custom certificates to, to have this pass through and check what the apps are actually communicating to their home servers. Have you found a way to uh, make this easier? Or, or yes, like so we, we actually hit the same issue you're, you are in some respects. So the installing of um, custom, certi custom certificates was not really an obstacle because you can add them, use it. if it's a root device, you can add them to the system store and then they are trusted uh, by all the apps on the, on the device. Uh, the problem we're now hitting is that Android 9 and 10 have TLS 1.3 and TLS 1.3 detects that there's a man in the middle or at least it, it tries to and might terminate the connection. Uh, this is a bit of a problem. So currently, all our research is still running on Android 8.1 devices. This isn't going to be sustainable long term, though. Um, four. Hi. Thank you for the great talk. Um, your research is obviously targeted in a constructive, critical way towards companies that are making apps surrounding menstrual research. Did you learn anything from this context that you would want to pass on to people who research this area more generally. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of uh, Fatiman and Corb in the US who've done microdosing research on LSD. 
and are starting a breakout study on menstrual issues? Well, I think, and this is what I, I was concluded on, is that I think there's, a, there's still a lot of research that needs to be done in terms of the sharing. And obviously, I think anything that touches on, on people's health uh, is, uh, is, is a key priority because it's something people re relate very strongly to. Uh, the consequences, especially in the US, for example, uh, of sharing health data like this, of, uh, of having you know, data even like your blood pressure and so on. Like what, what are the consequences if those uh, informations are gonna be shared, for example, with like insurance companies and so on. Uh, so this is why I think it's absolutely essential uh, to have a better understanding of, uh, of the, the, the data collection and sharing practices of, of the services, the moment when you have uh, health data that's being involved. Yeah, because we often focus about this being an advertising issue but in that sense as well, like insurance and even credit referencing and all sorts of other things become yeah. problematic, especially when it comes to you know, pregnancy related. Yeah, even employers could be after this kind of information. Yeah. Uh, six. Hi, uh, I'm wondering if there is uh, an easy way or a tool which we can use to uh, detect if apps are using our data or uh, uh, reporting them to Facebook or whatever or if we can even use those apps but block this data from being rep reported to Facebook? Uh, yeah, so you, you, you can firewall off graph.facebook.com and stop sending data. But like, there's, a, there's a few issues here. So firstly, it doesn't really, like, uh, this audience can do this. <laughs> Most users don't have the technical nuance to know what needs to be blocked, what doesn't necessarily need to be blocked. Um, it's on the companies to be careful with users' data. It's not up to the user to try and defend against. It, is not, it shouldn't be on the user to defend against uh, malicious data sharing or... Cause, uh, and also, like, one interesting thing was that Facebook had put this in place of like, where you could opt out from data sharing with the apps you're using. But that only works for if you're a Facebook user. Uh, and as I said, like, this data has been collected whether you're a user or not. So in a sense, for people who are in Facebook users, they couldn't opt out of this. Yeah. The, the Facebook SDK that developers are integrating, uh, the default state for sharing of data is on. It's tr uh, the, the, the flag is true. Um, and although they, they have a long thing on a long legal text on the, uh, the help pages for their developer tools, the, uh, it's like unless you're, you have a decent understanding of local data protection practice or local protection law, it's like it's not, it's not something that most developers are going to be able to understand why this flag should be something different from on, why this, you know, there's, there's loads of flags in the, the, uh, the SDK, which flags should be on and off depending on which d jurisdiction you're selling to, it's, uh, or use, your, data, your users are going to be in. Signal Angel again. Do you know any good apps which don't share data and are privacy friendly? Probably even one that is open source. So, I mean, as the problem, which is why I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't want to vouch for any app, is that even in the apps that you know, where in terms of like the the traffic analysis we've done, we didn't see any uh, any data sharing. As Chris was explaining, the data can be shared at a later stage, and it'd be impossible for us to really find out. Uh, so I, I, no, I, I can't, I can't be, I can't be vouching for any app. I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, the the problem is like we can only ever look in like at, at one spe specific moment in time as to see whether data is being shared, and like what was good today might be bad tomorrow, and what was bad yesterday might be good today. Um, Although I have been, I was in uh, Argentina recently um, speaking to a, a group of uh, feminist activists, and they have a, they've been developing a uh, menstruation tracking app, and their app was removed from the Google Play Store because it had illustrations that were deemed pornographic, but they were illustrations around medical related stuff. So even people who were trying to do the right thing, going through the open source channels are still fighting a completely different issue when it comes to menstruation tracking. It's a very fine line. Um, three. Sorry, you can't hear. The mic's not working. No. Microphone three. 
Best. Yes. Hey, thanks oh, yeah, for the great, great talk. Perfect. Uh, I was wondering um, if the Graph API endpoint was actually uh, in place to track menstruation data, or is it more like a general purpose uh, advertisement tracking thing? Or yeah. So my understanding is that there's two broad kinds of data that Facebook gets. There's uh, automated app events that Facebook are aware of, so app open, app close, um, app install, uh, relinking. Uh, relinking is quite an important one for Facebook. That's where it checks to see whether you already have a Facebook account logged in to log the app to your Facebook account, from my understanding. There's also a load of custom events that the app developers can put in that is then collated back to a data set, of on, I would imagine, on the other side. So when it comes to things like uh, whether there's a nausea or some of the other health issues, it's actually being uh, cross-referenced by the developer. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, five, microphone five. Um, can you repeat what you said in the beginning about the uh, menstruation apps used in Europe, especially Clue and the period tracker? Yeah, so uh, those are the most popular uh, apps actually across the world, um, not just in Europe and the US. A lot of them, in terms of like the traffic analysis stage, a lot of them have not cleaned up their acts. So we don't see, we can't see any, uh, any data sharing happening at that stage. Uh, but as I said, I can't be vouching for them and saying, oh, yeah, those are safe and fine to use uh, because we don't know what's actually happening to the data once uh, it's been collected by the app. All we can say is that as far as the research we've done goes, we didn't see any, any data being shared. The, like, uh, those apps you mentioned have been um, investigated by the Wall Street, Wall Journal, Wall Street Journal and the New York Times or relatively recently, so they've been had quite like a spotlight on them, so they've had to really up their game in a lot of ways, which is what we like everyone to do. But uh, as, as Eva says, we don't know what else they might be doing with that data on their side, not necessarily between the phone and the server, but from their server to another server. Microphone one. Hi, uh, thank you for the insightful talk. I have a question that goes in a similar direction. Do you know whether or not these apps, even if they adhere to GDPR rules, collect the data to then, at a later point, at least sell it to a higher, like the highest bidder, because a lot of them are free to use. And I wonder, like, what is their main goal besides? Possibly. Like, I mean, it, 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 advertisement is how is how they they make profit. And so, I mean, the, the whole uh, the whole question about them trying to know if you're pregnant or not is so that this information can eventually, you know be monetized through, you know, through the, the, how they, they target the advertisement. Uh, are you, like when you're actually, when you're using those apps, you could see in some of the slides, like you're constantly like being flashed with like all sorts of advertisement on, on the app. Um, you know, whether they're selling it externally or not, I'm not, you know, I, I can't tell. Uh, but what I can tell is, yeah, they, their business model is advertisement. So they are deriving profit from the data they collect. Absolutely. Um. Again, on microphone one. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if there was more of a big data kind of aspect to it as well, because these are really interesting medical like information on, on women's cycles in general. Yeah, and the, the answer is like, I, I can't, it, this is a bit of a black box, and especially in the way, for example, that Facebook is using this data, like, we don't know. Uh, we can assume that this is like part of the, we could assume this is part of the profiling that Facebook does of both their users and their non-users. Uh, but the way, the way this data is actually uh, processed also by, uh, by those apps through data brokers and so on, it's, uh, it's a bit of a black box. Microphone one. Yeah, uh, thank you a lot for your talk. And I have two and completely different questions. Um, the first one is, you've been focusing a lot on advertising and, and how this data is used to sell to advertisers. But I mean, like whether you aim to be pregnant or not, it's like it has to be the best kept secret, at least in Switzerland, for any female person. Because like if you also want to get employed, your employer must not know whether or not you want to get pregnant. And so I would like to ask, like, how likely is it that this kind of data 
is also potentially sold to um, employers who might want to poke into your health and like reproductive situation. And then my other question is entirely different because we also know that um, female health is one of the least researched topics um, mm -hmm. around and that's actually a huge problem. Like so, mu so little yeah. is actually known about like um, female health and, and the kind of data that these apps collect is actually a gold mine to do yeah. research on, 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 yeah, on, on, on health issues that are specific for certain bodies like female bodies. And so I would also like to know like how would it be possible to still gather this kind of data and still, uh, and still collect it but use it for like uh, a beneficial purpose like yeah. to, to improve knowledge on these issues. Sure. So, uh, to uh, I mean, answer your first question, it, the answer will be similar to uh, the previous answer I gave, which is, uh, it, you know, it's a black box problem. It's like it's very difficult to know exactly, you know, what's actually happening to this data. Uh, obviously, GDPR is there to, to prevent some things from happening, uh, but as we've seen from uh, the apps, like they were, you know, towing uh, a very blurry line, and so. The risk, obviously, of a, I, I, it, this is something that can't be rolled out. I can't be saying, oh, this is happening because I have no evidence that this is happening. Uh, but obviously, the, the risk are, master, are multiple. The risk are like uh, employers, as you say, that insurance companies that could get it, uh, that political parties could get it and target their messages based on the information they have about your mood, about you know, even the fact that you're trying to start a family. So, yeah, th there is like a very broad range of risk. Uh, the advertisement we know for sure is happening because this is like the basis of their uh, business model. Uh, the risk, the, the, uh, the range of risk is very, is very broad. The, uh, uh, the, to, to just expand that, like, again, as Eva said, we can't like, point out a specific example of any of this. But if you look at some of the other data brokers, so Experian is a data broker. They collect, they, they have a statutory response, or in the UK at least, they have a statutory job of being a credit reference agency, but they also run what is, I believe, the deemed data enrichment. And one of the things that uh, employers can do is buy Experian data to when hiring staff. Um, like, I can't say that this, this data ever ends up there, but they, you know, there's, they are collect, there is people collecting data and using it for some level of auditing. And to, to answer your second question, um, I think this is a very important problem you point out, is the question of like, data inequality and whose data get collected for what purpose. Uh, there is, I w do quite a lot of work on like, uh, delivery of state services, for example. Uh, when there are populations that are isolated, this not using technology and so on, you might just be missing out on uh, people, for example, who uh, should be in need of... Um, of uh, healthcare, of state support, and so on, just because you lack data about, about them. Uh, and so female health is obviously a very key issue. Uh, we, just, we literally lack uh, sufficient health data about, uh, about women on women's health specifically. Now, in terms of how data is processed in medical research, uh, there, there's actually protocol uh, in place normally to ensure, uh, to ensure consent, to ensure explicit consent, uh, to ensure that the data is, uh, is properly collected. And so I think I, I wouldn't want to mix the two just because the way those apps have been collecting data, if, you know, if there's one thing to, to take out of this, uh, of this talk is that uh, it, it's been nothing short of horrifying, really. Uh, that data is, is being collected before and shared. Uh, before you even get to consent to anything, I wouldn't trust any of those private companies to really be the ones uh, uh, carrying, uh, well, taking part in, uh, in, in medical research uh, on, on those. Uh, so I agree with you that there, there is a need for uh, better and more data on, on women's health, but I don't, think, I don't think any of those actors so far have proved to be trusted on this. Microphone two. Yeah, thank you for this great talk. Um, short question. What do you think is the rationale of uh, these menstruation apps to uh, integrate the Facebook SDK if they don't get money from Facebook or uh, being able to commercialize um, this data? That's a good question. Um, it could be a mix of things. So sometimes it's literally the, the, the 
developers literally just have this as part of their tool chain and their workflow when they're developing apps. Um, I don't necessarily know about these two period trackers, about what other apps are developed by these companies, but um, in, our, uh, in our previous work, which I presented last year, you find that some companies just produce a load of apps and they just use the same tool chain every time, and that includes, by default, the Facebook SDK as part of their tool chain. Um, and some of them are do, like, in, include it for what I would regard as like genuine purposes, like they want their users to share something or they want their users to be able to log in with Facebook. And in those cases, they include it for what would be regarded as a legitimate reason. But a lot of them just don't ever actually, they have it integrated, it does app events, and they don't ever really use anything of it other than that. And then, then a lot of developers seem to be quite unaware of that the default state is verbose and how it sends data to Facebook. Yeah, maybe we can close with one last question from me. Um, you tested surely a bunch of apps. How many of them do certificate pinning? Um, we uh, you see this as a widespread policy, or they just not really. I've yet to see. I've yet to have a problem doing an analysis where certificates been pinned. As I say, TLS 1.3 is proving to be more problematic than pinning. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and uh, yeah.